And we are following breaking news tonight. The president is shattering just about every diplomatic norm imaginable in a series of Twitter attacks, including a stunning boast that his nuclear button is bigger and more powerful than Kim Jong-un's. Let's bring in our experts right now. And I'm going to go to you first, Admiral Kirby. You heard uh, Director Clapper say there that tweets like this, tweets like the president put out tonight, moves us closer to war. Your reaction? Uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, Director Clapper on that. And he, and he hit it on the head when he talked about the risk of miscalculation. Uh, look, uh, in foreign policy, clarity and credibility are everything. And it's hard to get clarity and credibility in a tweet. Uh, as blunt as the president is. And you never know how these words are going to get misinterpreted overseas. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of visibility into the way Kim Jong-un thinks or how his decision-making apparatus is constructed. So tweeting at him like this with this bellicosity and these threats are not doing anything to de-escalate the tension. And I do worry about miscalculations, him making decisions based on misinformation or wrong assumptions that could lead us right to, to war. And what we do know, though, is Kim Jong-un is someone who wants power, who wants to stay in power. His image is very important to him. Are you concerned a tweet like that sort of taunting him to, yeah. you know, hey, my nuclear button works, yours doesn't, yeah. will provoke him to act and I say... I think that I, it's an excellent question. I think we need to remember that, that Kim Jong-un and the North Korean establishment views to the best of our knowledge, views the United States as an existential threat, mm -hmm. uh, as a nation state that is designed to wipe them off the face of the map. And so when they hear those things, we might think that's just Trump being blunt mm -hmm. or Trump being Trump. To them, they most likely hear that as a no kidding, direct overt threat to their very existence. And that, again, does nothing to de-escalate the tension. It also closes down maneuver space. Kim Jong-un's maneuver space, politically, but also Donald Trump's po political maneuver space. Uh, Director Clapper used the phrase paranoid to describe North Korea. I have to ask you a question. You, you worked inside the Bush administration, but also for the Trump administration early on. When I hear from people inside the relevant departments here, in this case the Defense Department, talking about a president itching for war, closing the door to diplomacy, uh, th those are not normally folks who panic uh, at, at, at a presidential tweet. But fact is, here is a president making an official statement via Twitter, uh, you know, in effect, a nuclear threat here. Uh, how consequential do you think that is? You know, it's consequential, but I don't think necessarily in the way, way you, that some people are afraid of. It's not actually escalating toward nuclear war. And instead of listening to bureaucrats in the Pentagon or the State Department, I would pay more attention to what foreign leaders are taking from this. And they see a president who is reacting incidentally to a threat of nuclear war that was started by North Korea. It was North Korea threatening South Korea, our treaty ally, where we have 25,000 troops and tens of thousands of American citizens, and reacting to that. Uh, and approaching this differently than the last several administrations who have followed all of the rules, uh, performed all of the diplomatic niceties, and gotten nothing. But, but aren't those rules, I mean, the, the, we're not talking about rules for, for the sake of rules. We're talking about rules designed by multiple administrations, Democrat and Republican, to avoid a war, right? It, 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 the rules... The rules aren't there for etiquette, right? They're, they're, they're there to save people getting killed. The thing with the rules is those rules aren't sort of adhered to by North Korea or by China, which, of course, supports North Korea. And these same claims were that this sort of direct talk, this plain talk, is going to lead to war was used against Ronald Reagan when he talked about tearing down the Berlin Wall. That was thought to be extremely provocative. When he called the Soviet Union an evil empire and said it would be consigned oh, to the Ronald Reagan, to be history. fair, made some very strong comments about the, the, the threat of nuclear war and that no one can win a nuclear war. And, uh, on the nuclear front, he was... That's right. And what Trump... That's another, I think, key point, is Trump is not really threatening nuclear war. He's just demonstrating what really is apparent to all the leaders in charge, which is North Korea is adequately deterred. There's not going to be a nuclear war with North Korea, because North Korea knows that would be suicidal. Likewise, there's mm -hmm. not going to be a general war, because we are adequately deterred by North Korean conventional forces. Uh, John Kirby, you, you've been a bureaucrat in the Defense <laughs> yes, Department, the State Department. You've served in the Navy. Threats, Your yeah. response? I, I, uh, I, I understand where uh, Christian's coming from. I disagree, though. I, I, don't, I do think that that tweet was very much about threatening nuclear war when he talks about the button and being bigger. And there's, no, there's no other button he's talking about but nuclear uh, war. And while it's true that uh, Mr. Trump inherited a much more dangerous situation on the peninsula than anybody previously, and he's not wrong when he, when he complains about that. Mm -hmm. And I have given his national security team great credit for the work that they did. They, they, to their credit, they have gotten China to do more. No question about it. Uh, and although China still has a ways to go. 
But he keeps undercutting his team's own efforts with these mm -hmm. tweets. It, they're unnecessary. And that's where I guess I disagree. Ago. I don't really think them as being useful diplomatic tools. I think he's actually hurting his own team's good efforts. And they have actually worked pretty hard on this problem. Because it, it does make you wonder, you know, you just heard Secretary Tillerson a couple of weeks ago talking about wanting to, to talk to North Korea, being open to that. And then you see tweets like this. If rhetoric like this makes dip diplomacy yeah. impossible at some point. You yeah. Know. And again, it comes down to clarity in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what's different about the Cold War and today is we don't have the same kind of situational awareness about the way decisions are made in Pyongyang that we did back during the Cold War in terms of what was going on in Moscow. And, and Jeff Delhoney, I want to bring you in because, you know, you look at the president's Twitter feeds since the new year began. Um, he has threatened nuclear war. He has blamed President Obama on the Iran front, vowed to cut funding to Pakistan and the Palestinians, attacked the Justice Department and urged it to go after his political opponents, went after the media and Democrats, and took credit for zero commercial aviation deaths in 2017. Is there something prompting this? What is going on here? And that was nearly before lunchtime today. Uh, yes. Uh, more than 15 <laughs> tweets today. Yes. Uh, I think we're seeing a couple things. I was talking to officials throughout the day at the White House, and these, uh, you know, are taking some of them by surprise. He's been pent up, in the words of one official. He's been um, at his uh, vacation uh, retreat in Florida for about 10 days or so. He's back now. He's plugged in. And I think there is the possibility that something else is going on here. He knows more about the Russia investigation through his attorneys and other things about uh, um, what may be coming, so is there a mood swing that's coming here? We're not mm -hmm. sure, but I do think the fact that he's tweeting about all of these things is so interesting. But I was thinking back mm -hmm. when I was uh, in Seoul, when he was giving his speech about the uh, threat in such a different message than he's giving online tonight, of course. But I think the reality here is so many more Republicans in this town want him to talk about the legislative agenda. He barely mentioned that today. The deep state thing was, uh, you know, the main focus until this now, of course. So right. something has changed in the last 24 hours. We it's a sign into his mood. That was a headline, for, you know, and then all of a sudden the North Korea stuff is. But you it's can't forget he said his own question. Justice Department with his own attorney general that he appointed. Yes. I mean, there's been a history of lashing out when, when, when he feels threatened. Christian, I have to ask you. So, again, just in the last several hours, uh, tweeting about Pakistan, a, a long, difficult ally, if you want to call ally, frenemy perhaps, difficult relationship through multiple administrations, uh, the Palestinians... Uh, Jerusalem, the negotiations uh, there, but also North Korea. Practically, realistically, does anything, does any good from a foreign policy perspective come out of tweets like this from the President of the United States? Absolutely. You're seeing three fundamental changes in the world. All of these were foreshadowed in the new national security strategy that was released last month. Uh, the tweets against Pakistan, that's a fundamental realignment of foreign policy in favor of India that was started by previous presidents, but it's really uh, coming into its own under this presidency. And part of that is to ba counterbalance and, in fact, encircle China, even though it's not called that. The tweets about uh, the Palestinians, that's a fundamental shift. We're moving away from this idea that solving the Israeli-Palestinian dispute somehow solves all the problems in the Middle East. The opposite is actually probably true. And it's almost impossible to solve Israeli-Palestinian disputes without sort of well, you just, other problems. To be clear, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice explanation for what the president was trying to do there. But the fact is, the, the words, I mean, he's talked about cutting off funding to the Palestinians. Is that part of a negotiation strategy? It's, it's a signal that we are fed up that with the Palestinians' unwillingness to negotiate seriously. And that also prompted the decision timing on Jerusalem, I understand. Uh, just, again, this idea that we just need to find the right combination of carrots mm -hmm. and sticks, that's a 40-year failed policy that has failed to solve the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. The third one, of course, is the fundamental change on North Korea. So, yeah, this is, it's going to be a foreign policy year. We're in an election year. Mm -hmm. There's a big domestic agenda, but things tend not to get done in election years. So I think the president is focused very much on foreign affairs. All right. Thanks very much, Christian. Thank you to our panel.